for sure Putin is someone who causes the president to stay up. He's presented himself as a very unique kind of specimen. To fight better than to capitulate. Vladimir Ilyich Putin. The facts are known. Born in St. Petersburg, now age 61, a law graduate, former head of intelligence, former prime minister, now a very wealthy man, president, and the latest in a long line of authoritarian Russian leaders going back centuries. The phrase cult of personality comes from the Russian kult lichnosky. Putin plays it to the full. But inside the man? Churchill's quote that Russia was a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma could have been written about Putin. One thing, though, is clear. He understands power and that his use of it guarantees his place in history. He sees uh, that's very much in line with Russia's sense of history, which is Russia as this, you know, third Rome, its own path, its third way. This is an inevitability for Russia being such a huge country. Putin the Great? Not yet. But 300 years after Peter the Great, he feels he has played a similar role, dragging his country into the modern world restoring its place as a power to be reckoned with. He knows his history, and looking west from Russia, you see the direction from which came the invaders. Napoleon in 1812, the British, French and Turks in the Crimean War, 1853, the Germans in 1914, and again in 1941. The psychological scars of this, especially from World War II, go deep. He regards himself not as politician, but as Russian officer who, in the very difficult situation, he feel his responsibility to the majority of Russian people and also to those Russian people who lived in history. Putin has never forgiven Mikhail Gorbachev for dismantling the Soviet Union, because as a nationalist, he knew the USSR was really the Russian Empire in ideological clothing. Gorbachev was replaced by Boris Yeltsin, who oversaw the accelerating decline of Russia. Yeltsin wasn't always fully focused, especially on foreign policy. Eastern Europe drifted westwards. He sold off state assets to the oligarchs. NATO announced its intentions to expand for the Baltic states and Poland, membership equaled security. Putin saw it as NATO advancing on Russia's borders. In late 1999, he inherited the presidency of a broken, chaotic country. And he said, that's enough. He started at home. As oil and gas prices rose, the Kremlin's coffers swelled. He began to rebuild the military. The Chechen separatists were smashed in two brutal wars. Other regions were put on notice. You're not leaving the Federation. At the same time, Putin re-centralized power and consolidated his grip on all sections of society. Politics, the courts, business, media. In 2004, he won a landslide and was re-elected president. But does he believe in democracy? I think his experience with democracy is that it is a sham. He doesn't really have any positive experiences of what it can do. He looks at the 1990s as an example of what happens when democracy is allowed to take its course. He's capable of entertaining the idea that it's necessary to, you know, to achieve his ends, to at least call Russia uh, as a state that has democratic institutions in order to be taken seriously. The Americans thought they could deal with him. At a summit in Slovenia, President Bush felt he had the measure of the man. I looked the man in the eye. I found him to be very straightforward and trustworthy. And we had a very good dialogue. 
I was able to uh, get a sense of his soul. Medvedev. In 2008, Putin's protege, Dmitry Medvedev, took over as president, and he took the role of prime minister. The constitution didn't allow three consecutive terms, so his title changed, but everyone knew he was still in charge. Now, with Russia stabilized, the bear began to sharpen its claws. First, energy wars. Russia supplies huge amounts of gas to European countries, and the pipelines go through Ukraine. Moscow began using gas prices to try and influence policy. But then came a real war. The Georgian conflict of 2008 put the world on notice. Russia was back on the world stage and intent on regaining its influence and pride, especially in what it calls its near abroad the borderlands. Its troops quickly took control of the region of South Ossetia. The Americans growled, NATO huffed and puffed. But it was clear no one except Georgia would go to war with Russia over South Ossetia. The whole of Eastern Europe and beyond internalized the lesson and waited for the next move. This came through diplomacy. Putin speaks fluent German, a legacy of his days as a KGB officer in Dresden. He's forged a strong relationship with Angela Merkel. Putin is thought to believe that unlike Britain, Germany is a European power which can be detached from overt American influence. The economic links between the two countries are now so strong that Berlin is constrained in how far it will go in challenging Moscow. They're very pragmatic, like he is, and he values that, uh, whereas I think uh, the UK and the United States, at least their outward foreign policy, is uh, more, uh, it leans more towards ideology and, and there's more talk of human rights. In late 2011, wishful thinkers said the cracks were showing. <laughs> that time was almost up in a country sick of authoritarianism. Demonstrations continued for weeks into what was dubbed the Moscow Spring, but tens of thousands of Muscovites marching in the streets did not represent Russia. Mr Putin, how worried are you that the protests will affect your election victory? Are you concerned? No, I'm not concerned. I think about uh, the people, ordinary people in Russia, and uh, of course, uh, uh, I see the protest uh, groups and uh, I think about it, what uh, I can to do with uh, all our citizens. And will you be making any further Thank concessions? You. Thank you. Thank you. A few months later, Vladimir Putin was back as president again. I promised you we would win. We won. He won 63% of the vote, down from 74% in 2004, but it was a margin of victory many Western leaders can only dream of. Now Western countries, led by the United States, want a Russia capitulation, and they want to overthrow himself. They want to crush independent behavior of Russian president and independent behavior of Russia. So, in such situation, to fight better than to capitulate. There have been moments of pure Putin, the man who can keep the world waiting before arriving center stage. But his personal life took a downturn. He'd been married to Ludmilla for 30 years. They have two grown-up daughters. In the summer of 2013, the Kremlin announced they would divorce, saying it was a joint decision as they rarely saw each other anymore. There were rumours of his friendship with a younger woman, but few details and few Russian media outlets dared take on the story. Soon there would be a much bigger story to tell. 
Over the border, in a city Russia once thought of as part of the motherland, the stage was being set for a dramatic act. One which would once and for all put pay to any doubts about what motivates Vladimir Putin and how far he will go to pursue his aims. In Kiev, the battle lines were drawn. Putin wanted President Yanukovych to look east, to join the Russian-led Eurasian Union. The European Union and the USA wanted him in the Western fold. Putin knew that would probably result in Ukraine joining NATO. The Western alliance would then have moved right up to Russia on a 2,000-mile-long border. Some people looked at the demonstrators in Kiev and saw people fighting for democracy. Putin looked at the same people and saw the hand of the West attempting a coup d'etat. The demonstrators won the battle. The president fled to Russia, where he was ignored by Putin, who had always disliked him. Besides, he was busy. The Russian media went into overdrive, saying that fascists were behind the change in government in Ukraine. This tugged on the psychological scars of the Second World War. There was solid backing for Putin to make a move, and the new parliament in Kiev made the move even easier by downgrading the status of the Russian language in Ukraine. Taking Crimea was even easier than taking South Ossetia six years previously. There was popular support for the move in the peninsula, and back home and everywhere else, the same lesson was learned as from the Georgian War. No one was coming to the rescue. Get down, get down. European Union sanctions were a pinprick, American sanctions tougher, but President Obama was reduced to irritating Putin by calling Russia just a regional power. What Russia is doing in Ukraine and the designs that Russia has on Eastern Europe have the potential to erase the post-Cold War uh, peace dividend that has uh, sort of spread over Europe, all, over all of Europe. This is a fundamental challenge to the established order, and it's one that needs to be uh, met with resolve on the part of both Washington and European capitals. Uh, it doesn't do anybody any good to belittle Vladimir Putin or belittle his ambitions. He is deadly serious. Next move? Putin doesn't seem like a gambler. He may consolidate his victory in Crimea and build for the next time. And most analysts think there will be a next time. Where I come from, geopolitics is still a competitive sport, and Putin is playing it very well. He understands that force, resolve, and in particular timing of the kind that he's exercised in Ukraine, frankly, way more and matter more than diplomacy, than negotiations. No one anymore is talking about the idea that Crimea will revert back to Ukrainian control. The question now is, Russia already has Crimea. Are they going to be satisfied with it? Vladimir Putin understands that overreaching was part of the reason for the downfall of the Soviet Union. He's unlikely to make the same mistake, and he's got time on his side. If he decides to run again, as he can, he may be president of the Russian Federation until 2024.